Buenos días tengan todos ustedes. Para darles la más cordial bienvenida a la ceremonia de inauguración de las primeras jornadas internacionales de estudios sobre la India, tiene la palabra el maestro Fernando Rodríguez Guerra, secretario académico de este instituto, en representación del doctor Mario Ruz Sosa. Muy buenos días. Eh, es para mí un enorme gusto, eh, en nombre del doctor Mario Humberto Ruz, director de este instituto y del propio Instituto de Investigaciones Filológicas, darles la bienvenida a estas Jornadas Internacionales de Estudios sobre la India. Eh, tengo el placer de acompañar en esta, en esta inauguración a muy distinguidas personalidades. En primer lugar, dar la bienvenida a... Su Excelencia, el señor embajador de la India, Shruti Muktesh Pardeshi, bienvenido. Eh, también a nuestro coordinador de Humanidades, que nos va a hacer favor de inaugurar el evento, el doctor Al Alberto Vital Díaz, eh, investigador y exdirector de este instituto, que vuelve a casa, donde siempre es bienvenido. Eh, a la doctora Alicia Girón, directora del Programa Universitario de Estudios sobre Asia y África, y al doctor Bernardo Berruecos, coordinador del Centro de Estudios Clásicos, la entidad del instituto que organiza este evento, que, que, que coorganiza este evento. Hay que también reconocer y mencionar a todas las otras entidades y eh, eh, dependencias que organizan este evento, en primer lugar el programa, el PUEA, ¿no? que dirige la doctora Girón, y también con la colaboración de eh, tanto el Colegio de México como eh, la UAM Iztapalapa, perdón, eh, sí, la, la UAM Coajimalpa, el CRIM y el Centro de Estudios de Asia y África del Colegio de México. Eh, simplemente agradecer la presencia de todos ustedes. Eh, para el Instituto es muy importante participar en esta primera jornada eh, de estudios sobre el subcontinente de la India y pues simplemente darles la bienvenida, agradecer a los organizadores, muy especialmente a la doctora Wendy Phillips, quien por parte de Filológicas tuvo a su cargo la organización de este, de este evento. Pues entonces simplemente reiterar mi agradecimiento, la bienvenida y doy la palabra entonces a... Bueno, ahora nos dicen. <risa> Muchas gracias. A continuación, es un honor contar con la presencia de su excelencia Sri Muktesh Pardeshi, embajador de la India en México. Your Excellence, we are honored. Thank you very much. Very good morning. I'm delighted to be here at UNAM, uh, uh, with which my connection go back to 93. Uh, some of you might know that I studied the Spanish language at uh, CEPE. So as a former alumni, I have always a great pleasure to be back. I must compliment the, the organizers of uh, this three-day symposium. I think it's an opportune moment to have uh, such programs on India when the political, economic and cultural ties between the two countries are growing. Uh, for the first time, our political contacts have uh, intensified to the extent that during the last three years, uh, President Peña Nieto and Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi met four times in three years. And uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi was here in Mexico after a gap of 30 years as Prime Minister on a bilateral mission in, in, in 2016. For the first time, uh, India has become amongst the top trading partners of Mexico for the first time. And our bilateral trade amounted to 
$3 billion in 2017. For the first time, our cultural engagement with Mexico have gone to the extent that this year we are uh, Pais Invitado, guest of honor country at Cervantino Festival. Though it's not official, India will also be the guest of honor country at Guadalajara Book Fair next year in 2019. The only Asian country to have been invited as the guest of honor country at Guadalajara Book Fair. Now, in that context, the academic exchanges which are taking place uh, are very noteworthy and should be encouraged. So I see the today's, uh, the event, this week's event, especially in the light of the growing contacts between uh, um, two countries in all spheres. Uh, before coming, I was just looking at, curiously, that uh, uh, you know, studies about India has a tradition of 100 years. And the person who started some sort of Indian studies in Mexico has connection with this university. You would know that in 1919, for the first time, a full-length book in Spanish was written by Senor Jose Vasconcelos, who later became education minister as well as rector of UNA. So we are in a sense celebrating 100 years of the initiation of Indian studies in Mexico. Uh, in uh, 1920s, he wrote another book, Clásicos del Pensamiento, Classics of Thought, in which he writes about Mahatma Gandhi and Tagore. These were the two personalities which were known to Mexican scholars in 1920s. In the same decade, we had another, uh, I would say, political activist and, and uh, thinker arriving here, Emin Roy, who later founded the Mexican Communist Party. He used to contribute uh, columns to Mexican newspapers and derive uh, um, uh, inspiration or write uh, um, directly or indirectly about India. 1950s, um, after the establishment of diplomatic relations between two countries, I think interest in India grew up. And uh, uh, this university had a program in 60s, one year program on, on, on India, which was later discontinued. So interest in India had been there in 60s, 50s as well. We all know that in 60s, the El Colegio uh, de Mexico started the center of Asian and African studies, which uh, led to promotion of uh, knowledge about the India in a big manner. That center continues and plays a lead role. And I'm very happy that El Colegio de Mexico is also uh, associated with, with this program. One person from Mexico who interpreted India to the outside world was Octavio Paz. Mm -hmm. And his connection with India goes back to 1950. When, when Mexico established uh, uh, its embassy in India, Mexico picked up one of its former presidents to represent Mexico in India. And in his team was a young diplomat who would later become a Nobel Prize winner in the field of literature. So Octavio Paz stayed uh, twice in India, in 50s as a young diplomat, and in 60s he returned as, as ambassador. So, India was seen through his eyes, through his writings, and uh, his contribution in interpreting India for Mexicans and outside world uh, has been uh, noted. And this year, when we are commemorating, I mean, we, we, you know, it's 20th uh, uh, death anniversary uh, this year, uh, we should uh, acknowledge the contribution which Octavio Paz has made in uh, bringing this two countries 
uh, and their scholars and their um, literary communities, artistic communities together in knowing each other. Since 2010, we have a, a cultural center, Gurudev Tagore Indian Cultural Center, supported by the embassy uh, in, in Polanco. Uh, we are not directly engaged in India studies, but uh, uh, we, wherever uh, occasion arises, we we support such initiatives. Uh, we are giving classes in uh, eleven disciplines, principally dances, music, uh, languages like Hindi and Sanskrit, the Indian cooking, and that has led to, uh, in its own modest way. Uh, promoting India and knowledge about India uh, in, in Mexico. So I'm very happy to be uh, here this morning and I promise you from the, the Indian Embassy side we'll be always be encouraging such activities. Please allow us to support uh, your future activities by uh, funding uh, the visit of Indian scholars uh, from India or uh, uh, universities in UK or, or US. So please feel free to, to approach us uh, in whatever manner we can uh, support such activities. If the deliberations of this three-day symposium is ready, we can, I don't know how much time you're taking, either we can launch at the sidelines of the Cervantino Festival in October this year, otherwise definitely that should be out for the 2019 uh, book fair in Guadalajara. Okay. So thank you very much and I wish all success. Many thanks. Enseguida hará uso de la palabra la doctora Alicia Girón González, directora del programa universitario de estudios sobre Asia y África. Bien, pues es un honor compartir aquí el, el presidium con el señor embajador de la India, su excelencia, su excelencia Shiri Muktesh Pardesh, y eh, con nuestro coordinador de Humanidades, Alberto Vital, y con Fernando Rodríguez, secretario académico de este instituto, y también con nuestro colega del Centro de Estudios de la, de la India. Bien, eh, pues yo agradezco muchísimo a quien tuvo la el ímpetu para poder organizar este, estas jornadas de la India, dado que eh, el hecho de estar aquí es resultado de una lluvia de ideas, sobre todo a raíz de que una de las riquezas más grandes que tiene el programa universitario de estudios sobre Asia y África es el comité directivo y los representantes que están en ese comité. A través de ellos se hizo, eh, cuando éramos un seminario de estudios sobre Asia, un plan de trabajo y posteriormente hemos seguido trabajando con los que conforman este cuerpo del, del asesor del comité eh, directivo y de ahí la idea de ir formando de cada país eh, jornadas de estudio específicas sobre los países tanto de Asia y África. Quizás no alcanzarían los días del año para tener jornadas de todos los países, pero sí eh, eh, es un orgullo iniciar las primeras jornadas del estudio de la India con la participación de una de las representantes en estudios sobre India, que es la doctora Wendy Phillips. Yo agradezco mucho a Wendy porque cuando se recibió la invitación por parte del doctor Guillermo Aguilar para visitar el Centro de Estudios Mexicanos en Reino Unido, que está en King's College, eh, se hizo la invitación para que yo asistiera y conociera el Instituto de la India. Y bueno, definitivamente eh, la persona indicada para acompañarme era Wendy, quien con mucho entusiasmo hizo una agenda de cinco días para visitar todas las universidades relacionadas no solamente con la India, sino con los estudios de Asia y de África. Entonces, a partir de ahí se crea todo un programa 
esto el, eh, llegamos hoy, pero después de un año de trabajo, llegamos eh, al día de hoy, lo cual hay que celebrar. Yo solamente quisiera decir algunas cosas que me parece que son muy importantes y es que definitivamente la India requiere un estudio mucho más profundo. En primer lugar, es la democracia más grande del mundo. Seguí con mucho detenimiento eh, todas las votaciones para el, el, el presidente eh, Modi y duraron cerca de un, año, de un mes porque van eh, haciendo las elecciones por estados. Es una población que tiene más de un billón de habitantes y que está por superar el número de habitantes a China que tiene 1.3%. Algo que es muy importante mencionar es que al día de hoy India supera la tasa de crecimiento del Producto Interno Bruto. Si China pudo, estaba a dos dígitos antes de la crisis, bajó bastante a 6, 6.2. China está en 6.8 y la India está en 7%. Y esto es muy interesante porque... Aquí es donde hay que, yo creo que la India es una lección en la medida que se han dado reformas que aparentemente eh, llamaron mucho la atención, como es la desmonetización de, de, de esta reforma que se hizo, reforma monetaria, hace dos años, pero también la reforma eh, fiscal. Y esto hay que aprender muchísimo porque efectivamente hay un grado muy alto de desigualdades, pero también hay que entender las razones culturales que de alguna manera permean lo que es el desarrollo de la India. Y algo que me llama mucho la atención es la injerencia y la importancia que tienen las mujeres en lo que viene a ser la cultura y el desarrollo de este país. Falta mucho que hacer, sabemos que hay... Eh, la, las empresas, las grandes empresas en su mayoría son públicas y que se está tratando de abrir mucho más a la iniciativa privada, principalmente en lo que es en, en el carbón, en, en los bancos. Y tiene un reto debido a que casi el 80% del petróleo lo importa y esto está afectando definitivamente en estos momentos a los precios a nivel interno. No voy a seguir con más datos porque definitivamente eh, me puse, bueno, vengo estudiando sobre todo la, la concentración y centralización de los bancos y las crisis que ha tenido la India, pero al querer hacer un discurso pequeñito para el día de hoy, pues resulta que era tanta la información que nada más saqué lo que ustedes han oído. Lo más, creo que es lo, lo más importante y algunas ideas que había que, que dejarlas aquí. Pues muchísimas gracias, señor embajador, muchísimas gracias, profesor Sunil, este, profesora Catherine Bu, porque realmente es un placer tenerlos a ustedes aquí este día. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. El doctor Bernardo Berruecos Frank, coordinador del Centro de Estudios Clásicos, hará uso de la palabra. Bueno, pues muy buenos días a todos. Es para mí un honor estar aquí en esta distinguible y, y honorable, distinguida y honorable mesa de inauguración con el, su excelencia el señor embajador Shri Muktesh Pardeshi, eh, nuestro señor coordinador eh, Alberto Vital Díaz, la doctora Alicia Girón y nuestro secretario académico Fernando Rodríguez Guerra. Y bueno, pues insisto, es un gran honor estar en esta mesa de inauguración de este evento tan importante eh, como coordinador del Centro de Estudios Clásicos de este instituto, me es muy grato dar inicio a las actividades de estas jornadas internacionales de estudios sobre la India, que en realidad son muy importantes para nuestro centro de investigación, ya que en él eh, no solo estudiamos las lenguas clásicas, el griego y el latín, sino también a través del trabajo académico de la coordinadora de estas jornadas, la doctora Wendy Phillips, también estudiamos la lengua y la literatura eh, de la India. Celebro ampliamente que estas jornadas no se circunscriban únicamente a cuestiones eh, estrictamente relacionadas con lengua y literatura de la India clásica, sino también a otros campos de trabajo de enorme interés, como lo son los estudios sobre la India moderna y contemporánea, eh, los asuntos jurídicos o los estudios anglo-indios y de recepción y, y traducción. 
No me queda pues más que felicitar a todos los organizadores, en particular a la doctora Wendy Phillips, pero también a la doctora Laura Carballido de la UAM Coajimalpa y al doctor Oscar Figueroa del, del CRIM, que eh, contribuyeron muy importantemente a la organización de estas jornadas y eh, pues agradecer a todas las entidades participantes y desearnos a todos nosotros unas muy enriquecedoras y fructíferas jornadas que espero sean las primeras de muchas otras más. Muchísimas gracias. gracias. A continuación, el doctor Alberto Vital Díaz, coordinador de Humanidades de esta universidad, dará inicio formal a las actividades de estas jornadas. Muy buenos días tengan ustedes. Doy la bienvenida al excelentísimo señor embajador Muktesh Pardeshi. Bienvenido señor embajador a los conferencistas inaugurales. Eh, welcome to our country, welcome to our university. Los señores eh, Sonil Kilnani y Catherine Bu, Bu, muchas felicidades por estar aquí con nosotros. Quisiera comentar que aparte de el, la espléndida síntesis que nos ha hecho el señor embajador de presencias fundamentales de la cultura mexicana en la India, figuras tan importantes como José Vasconcelos y Octavio Paz, Agradecerle esa referencia, señor embajador, muy importantes. Quisiera también mencionar eh, nuestro querido y recordado universitario Juan Miguel de Mora, que tanto ha significado para la relación entre la cultura de la India y México y que fue investigador de nuestro instituto hasta eh, hace pocos años y quien generosamente eh, se jubiló para abrir espacio a una nueva generación. Quisiera mencionar también eh, el extraordinario trabajo que ha hecho la doctora Wendy Phillips eh, en la relación entre la India y México. Gracias a la doctora Wendy Phillips enseñamos hindi en la universidad. Thanks to Wendy Phillips, we teach Hindi in our university. Un gran esfuerzo institucional impulsado por personas. Saludo a la doctora Sara Sefjovic, presente en este auditorio, es un gusto. Y nos recuerda también que nuestra universidad tiene uno, un seminario universitario de estudios sobre culturas del Medio Oriente, vínculo natural con eh, los trabajos que aquí se realizan. Muchas gracias, Sara. Eh, y saludo, por supuesto, a la doctora Alicia Girón, quien, eh, con su magnífico equipo de trabajo, Vania de la Vega, José Luis Cruz, entre otros, <coughs> perdón, están realizando un extraordinario trabajo para vincular México con países extraordinarios, gigantes en este mundo contemporáneo como son la India, China, Japón y países que quizá por algunas razones son más pequeños pero que son de extremada, de extremada importancia como Vietnam por ejemplo, bueno Corea ya podemos considerarlo también, las dos Coreas, países de una extra extraordinaria importancia mundial incluso y vincular también estudios asiáticos con estudios africanos. Comentábamos hace un momento que eh, en Johannesburgo, comentaba el señor conferencista, en Johannesburgo hay estudios eh, africanos y asiáticos y es un vínculo natural también eh, con nosotros. Un gran trabajo, lo expreso siempre que me es posible, que está realizando la doctora eh, Alicia Girón. Ella nos permite, como economista, pensar en la relación también entre ciencias sociales, concretamente la economía, y los aspectos culturales. Finalmente, la economía es también un fenómeno cultural y la cultura es también 
un fenómeno vinculado con las distintas economías, los distintos fenómenos económicos. Por último, antes de inaugurar formalmente este extraordinario evento, quiero felicitar a, al Centro de Estudios Clásicos, porque, como lo acaba de decir el señor coordinador del centro, el doctor Bernardo Berruecos, en efecto, el Centro de Estudios Clásicos es, por su origen, un centro de investigaciones en Grecia y, y Roma, y su gran legado, extraordinario legado universal, pero asimismo, generosamente y en buena hora, se abre también a otros ámbitos clásicos, también de la mano de la doctora Wendy Phillips, pero también otros investigadores del Instituto, entonces, bienvenido ese, ese nuevo vínculo del Centro de Estudios Clásicos. Y al Instituto de Investigaciones Filológicas, nuestro instituto entrañable, eh, muchas felicidades, muchas gracias al eh, señor secretario académico del Instituto y al director del mismo, muchas gracias eh, por hacer posible estas jornadas. Y les pido entonces que nos pongamos de pie. Para, con puntualidad absoluta, siendo las 10.30 de la mañana de hoy, eh, miércoles 23 de mayo de 2018, me honro en dar por inaugurar las Jornadas Internacionales de Estudios sobre la India, Inventar la India. Enhorabuena y los mejores augurios. He's holder of the Avanta Chair and director of the India Institute, which he established at King's College London in 2011. He was formerly founder and director of South Asian Studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and has taught at other higher education institutions such as Birkbeck College and Seike University. There are many reasons we approached Professor Kilnani to set the tone of what we expect to be a long and fruitful series of academic gatherings. Let me mention just two of them. The title of this symposium, Inventing India, is a note to his seminal work, The Idea of India. For indeed, many of us have shaped our own ideas about what India is or could be from reading his work. Furthermore, Professor Kilnani's research interests lie at the intersection of various fields, and that brings us all together. Intellectual history and the study of political thought, the history of modern India, but also its debts to the ancient past, Demogra demo democratic theory in relation to its recent non-Western experiences, and, above all, strategic thought in the definition of India's place in the world. At the end of the 90s, there was a very popular ser TV series about the Mahabharata on Indian TV. The first episode started with the expression, Me Samaye Hong, I am time. And indeed, time itself was the narrator of the great history of India. This morning, I think we will have something very close to that in the presentation of Professor Kilnani. The first edition of his book, The Idea of India, was published in 1997. And here we are, 20, 21 years later, with a unique chance to hear from him his take on the path that India has taken since. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Phillips, Wendy. Um, it's really wonderful to be here, and it is uh, our first visit to Mexico, at least my first visit to Mexico. Um, it's a place I've read about, thought about a little bit, um, but never actually been able to be here. So I'm really delighted to, to be here on this occasion. I just wanted to say a few informal words before I turn to um, my remarks this morning. Um, I think it's a wonderful moment 
uh, to have this renewed and energetic engagement between Mexico and India. As His Excellency the Ambassador said uh, just earlier, there's a long history to it. Indeed, I think it's exactly 100 years ago, um, the Ambassador mentioned M.N. Roy. I think he when uh, 100 years ago when M.N. Roy crossed the border uh, into Mexico with Evelyn Trent, and then the rest is indeed history in this country. So um, <clears throat> it's, it's, I think also one of the things that came out in, in the remarks this morning is that as well as the connection of economics and politics and a whole variety of other fields, there's a very strong intellectual connection um, between the two countries. And that is a connection about free thinking, about uh, uh, critical thinking as well. And I, I think that's a, a wonderful thing we should remember and, and also uh, celebrate. I wanted to thank Wendy Phillips and all of the team here at UNAM uh, for organizing this. And I certainly hope that this will be the beginning uh, of uh, a long-running set of collaborations uh, between Mexico and India and between also us at the India Institute at King's College in London. Um, what we tried to do there with the India Institute is to set up a, uh, an interdisciplinary group of uh, researchers uh, focusing on the study of contemporary India. Um, we have about uh, eight uh, faculty members uh, and now in the space of around five or six years we have about 35 PhD students working on contemporary India across disciplines uh, the, in the post-47 period. So it's, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of scope I think for that kind of focused research work. Um, I'll also just uh, say a little bit about um, my, my remarks this morning. I, 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 it was very kind of Wendy Phillips to, to give me this opportunity to reflect on uh, my book, The Idea of India, which, as she said, came out in 1997. It came out then at a, at a particular moment in Indian history, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in my remarks. Um, and I think we're again at a, a critical moment in some ways in, in India's history. And that's part of, I think, a more general moment across the world uh, in terms of where we are with the idea of democracy today and the, the vision that we've had for what we think democratic societies should be. And so when I came to think about uh, revisiting the idea of India 20 years later, uh, I wanted really to address that question. Um, where is India today as a democracy? Countries are people, countries are their economies, countries are a whole variety of different things, but they're also ideas. And that's something that I've been very concerned with because I think that India was and is a very particular conception of what a country can be. It's a conception that uh, hasn't relied on many of the standard markers of national identity that you find, for example, in Europe. That's to say India never defined itself by one culture or one religion or one language or one ethnicity or even one region. It was, by its very definition, by the movement that took it to freedom and by the constitution that was established in 1950. It was a country committed to the notion of diversity and pluralism. And that makes for a complicated uh, politics, it makes for a complicated project and a complicated idea of what a nation is. And that's something that I've been long interested in, in trying to understand, in trying to provide the underlying logic for that idea, because it doesn't fit into the normal definitions of a nation state. Uh, many commentators from outside of India, and, and also some within India, in the early years after independence, didn't think India would work. Uh, they didn't think India was the kind of nation that uh, could succeed. Um, they thought that somewhere like Pakistan was a much clearer definition of what a nation was because it was defined by a single religion and a single uh, 
uh, culture, as it were, although, of course, that didn't turn out to be the case. But, but somehow India looked like a very um, unnatural kind of idea. So I've, I've in my work, been, been very concerned to try to draw out the underlying logic, if you like, the foundations of the political uh, conception of, of what modern India is. And it's, that's what I mean by the idea of India. So my remarks today uh, will be, as I say, in uh, the remarks of someone who is a student of India, uh, who, who's been trying to understand it over a long period of time, but also someone who is directly concerned with India's future and India's present, as, as, as if you like, as a kind of intellectual engagement with India, as much as a, 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 a scholarly one, or kind of combining the both. both. Um, so that's the, the, the opportunity that I'm, I'm taking um, with my remarks. And I'm going to leave, I hope, a good amount of time for questions and discussions. So I'm very happy to uh, you know, broaden uh, uh, from what I'll say into other areas of interest uh, uh, as, as the audience may have. Last year, 2017, as India prepared to celebrate its 70th, 70th year of freedom from colonial rule, with cultural pageants in foreign capitals to broadcast India's cachet abroad and military parades to impress Indians at home, I found myself gripped by two images taken a few weeks apart. And I still haven't been able to shake them from my head. The first image, a grainy video still, was captured in one of India's most brutalized peripheries, the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The video had been taken by a fearful passerby and uploaded to numerous Kashmiri websites, which the Indian government immediately tried to shut down. The picture shows a young Muslim man in a traditional woolen fairan and blue jeans, immobilized and dazed. On previous days, Farooq Dar made a living embro embroidering shawls. Now, in this image, he is bound to the bumper of an Indian military jeep, his beaten hands hanging limply at his sides. The Indian army has forced him to become a human shield as it advances through a crowd of other young Muslims who are protesting against military repression. The other image, a professional photograph seemingly designed to be iconic. It shows a bald, saffron-clad yogi, trim and almost boyish in his looks, smiling and flashing a victory sign. He has just been installed by representatives of his Hindu nationalist party as the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, with over 200 million people, the country's most populous state. Yogi Adityanath, the leader of one of India's influential Hindu monasteries, has made his political career by advocating extre extremist causes and inciting hatred towards Muslims, who, compri who comprise nearly one-fifth of his state. This photograph of a beatified, menacing man would be tweeted and Instagrammed millions of times. India likes to think of itself as a democracy, the world's largest and most diverse, no less. And since independence in 1947, democratic pluralism has been at the core of the country's self-image. It has been a way of looking its former colonizers in the eye, distinguish its, distinguishing itself from its neighbors, standing up to the ideological bullying of the world's superpowers, and of claiming a certain modern global status. But to me, these two images set against one another raise profound questions about India's identity, questions that parades and pageants are meant to deflect. What does it mean to be Indian today? Who among the citizenry counts? Who is expendable? When the prospect arose early in the 20th century that an independent India might become a democracy based on universal suffrage, the subcontinent's numerous minorities had reason to fear for their future. Muslims, Sikhs, Dalits, formerly known as untouchables, took the lead in articulating the dangers and in fighting for safeguards, territorial or constitutional. In the end, two-thirds of the subcontinent's Muslims chose the territorial option, 
heading to, leading to partition in 1947. In the years after, India reconstructed itself as a constitutional democracy, committed to the protection of minority beliefs of every kind. Some of the architects of that order, that constitutional order, worried that it might provoke majoritarian counter-reactions, or that it might erode under the pressures of social and religious prejudice. But as the country worked to build its economic and military standing, reduce poverty, and redress staggering caste injustice, the fact that its government was freely elected by almost one-fifth of the world's population, and one as humanly varied as any, bestowed a vital sustaining legitimacy. Yet, could that democracy vaunted by Indians also be a delusive falsehood, used to justify the routinized cruelties practiced by their state, whether in a heavily militarized Kashmir, the barely pacified Northeast, or far-flung insurgent Adivasi tribal regions across central India? And has it now become a self-righteous alibi for the exercise of state power, supposedly at the, surface, uh, at the service of an assertive majority, convinced that its numbers lend its claims irresistible force? As such questions mount today, I feel once more the urgency of 20 years ago when the idea of India was first published. The book came out in 1997, the 50th year of Indian independence, and another moment of celebration as well as of anxiety. Earlier in that decade, Hindu agitators had hacked to rubble a Mughal era mosque, the Babri Masjid, in hopes of replacing it with a temple to the popular god Ram, who many believed had been born at the mosque site at Ayodhya. Subsequent riots across the country left hundreds dead, and the marked rise of Hindu nationalism, led by a renascent political party, the Bharatiya Janata Party, or BJP, threatened to overturn the pluralist character of India's democracy. Against the efforts of founders like Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru to preserve space for a diversity of beliefs, a singular cultural template would, it seemed, be imposed. The danger of majority capture of the state has loomed over many post-colonial states, and indeed it has been realized in many of them too. But in India's short history, only in the 1990s, in independent India's short history, only in the 1990s had that possibility veered towards probability. As the BJP grew in strength, one of my hopes in writing this book was to reconsider the animating principles of the people who created this remarkable political invention, modern India. The debates that underpinned the making of modern India are among the most intricate in recent political history anywhere. Arguments about identity and difference, representation and dignity, liberalism and communitarianism, justice and inequality, freedom and power. They emerged from a long, contentious struggle for national freedom, and they were voiced with compelling sharpness as well as grace, not just by Gandhi and Nehru, but by B.R. Ambedkar, Vallabhbhai Patel, and a host of others. The legacy of these shaping arguments is an immense political and intellectual resource of value to us today not just in India, but I think globally. As I wrote my book, I was seeking to parry the self-satisfaction of many of my compatriots. Yes, we may be a little vicious to one another, but we are a democracy, as well as the reductive condescension of some Western commentators about the Indian experience. Yes, you may call yourselves a democracy, but I wanted to place India for all its political particularities in the universal context where I believed it rightly stood, as one of the world's great experiments with democracy, alongside the US and France, and every bit as convulsive of those histories have proved to be, and potentially even more consequential for democracy's future, 
in Asia and across the globe. I thought if we could see more clearly the complex history that had made modern India and recognize the hard-won principles that had emerged from intense intellectual arguments about nation and statehood, we might better understand the significance of India's foundational choices. I hoped, too, that we might realize we needed to sustain those choices far better than we in India are sometimes managing to do. As I pursued my research in archives and libraries, I traveled across the country as well. In Ayodhya, I spoke with smiling police guards at the site of the Babri Masjid, all Hindu, and enthused by what their co-religionists had done to the historic mosque they were duty-bound bound to protect. In, in, in Tumkur, down south, I watched a campaigning BJP leader and one of the instigators of the mosque's demolition extol his deeds in rousing language. I stopped in Chandigarh and saw its monumental Corbusier buildings, sandbagged and fortified against extremists who had been fighting for a Sikh homeland. Making my way through the spoiled beauty of Nagaland and parts of the Northeast, I met Angami, Al, and Konyak youths to whom Delhi seemed a distant imperial capital. Back then, I felt I was straddling fault lines that might widen to become nearly as perilous as those that in 1947 had split the country apart. In one of the chapters of my book, entitled Who is an Indian?, I wrote, for a few parenthetic decades, Nehru's improvised conception of a tolerable common Indianness seemed to suggest a basis for India's sense of itself. It was an explicitly political conception, and to sustain itself, it had constantly to persuade. But that conception, I argued, was giving way. I saw my book both as a historical analysis of the processes leading to that collapse, and as my own effort at political persuasion, aimed at renewing public investment in the Indian wager and building a pluralist democracy. As I rushed to finish the book, I wasn't certain that what it added up to. I would have chuckled if told that over the next two decades, the phrase, the idea of India, would trip off the tongues of prime ministers and leaders and enter the mainstream of public deba debate. At first, the phrase served as a shorthand for the unusually plural view of national identity that I identified with India's founding. Later, it became the sneer of choice, used by right-wing nationalists to denigrate those who believed in an India more complex than a Hindu state. And yet, interestingly, they sought also to appropriate the phrase for themselves. In a speech in Parliament, for instance, last year, Prime Minister Modi, the first leader of a BJP majority government, repeated the phrase 19 times in service of his own Hindu nationalist vision. I'd like to think that these tussles over four words, the idea of India, do more than just demarcate the divide between pluralist and majoritarian conceptions of India. Perhaps they could also help the arguments to engage with one another and even move them ahead. To me, in 1997, as today, the idea of a plural India, open to diverse and competing beliefs, is not an achieved ideal. It's a, it's a historical work in progress, a field of tension, or an arena of debate where differing conceptions of India can encounter one another, seeking each to persuade the other, and seeking and willing each to listen to the other. Yet that conception of a nation advancing through self-criticism to a more complex understanding of itself is regularly threatened by more exclusivist views of nation and of community. So in tandem with the book's historical diagnosis of how that had come about, the book also contained an argument for what we lose if we feel to keep the debates alive. The story that this book investigates was most often told as one in which the past was woven from a confluence of cultures. The, conf the story that you find in Tagore's 
the ambassador mentioned this morning, and also in Gandhi and in Nehru. That past, the official story went, had prepared India for a future that combined political freedom with toleration of religious and social differences. As I noted in the first edition, this was always a romanticized view of the Indian past, in many ways even a confused one, especially when it came to the, the relations between collective and individual freedom. But it seemed a useful fiction for a startup nation, especially one trying to hold together mercurial cultural and social diversities. Not all could bring themselves to, sus to subscribe to its promise of capacious tolerance. Indeed, the demand for partition was an indictment of its romanticism, a call to realism about the dangers facing the subcontinent's Muslim minorities in a future democratic order based on universal suffrage. That this apparent call to realism re re resulted in another form of romanticism, Pakistan, is another story. After 1947, the idea of India was more than an instrumental fable to rally support. It provided the principles upon which India's founders built a political order. As articulated through independent India's constitution, it served as an unprecedented definition of the relationship between state and nation. Unshy of ambition, the constitution aimed to create space for religious and cultural differences, to address age-old social inequalities, to foster individual liberties, and to disperse power across the branches of government so that legitimacy could not inhere in any single arm or office. It placed sovereignty, long usurped by the British, in the hands of Indians, though not in the hands of any particular Indians. The Indian founders refused the usual anchors of national identity, such as religion, race, and language, which classical European nationalism proffered. Markers which, on the other hand, were gracefully, gratefully embraced by the subcontinent's religious nationalists, whether Muslim or Hindu. The founders thus implicitly acknowledged that to keep this political contraption working would require in addition to legal and constitutional design, contingent skills, judgment, abilities to improvise and compromise, and plenty of luck. For all its vision, the Constitution was prey to subversions. Through consequences unintended, of course, and through cynical manipulation by subsequent generations more weakly committed to foundational principles. B. R. Ambedkar, one of the constitutional drafters, noted just before the constitution was adopted one of its inevitable limitations. All it could hope to do was establish the basic structure of the state, the distinctive legislative, executive, and judicial arms. How in practice this apparatus came to be worked would inevit inevitably depend, as he put it, on the people and political parties they, Indians, will set up as their instruments to carry out their wishes and their politics. As Ambedkar predicted, after 1947, the Indian fiction would come under constant strains, many of which I examined in my book. With the withdrawal of colonial power, what, sorry, when the withdrawal of colonial power removed an opponent, an opponent Indians could unite against, the democratic process incited new conflicts. More groups began to speak for their own interests, including non-elites, who felt sidelined in many of the debates of the independence movements. The intense political mobilizations produced by democracy engendered mobilizations of India's history, too. New heroes were consecrated. Others retired to storage godowns and statue parks. And I trace some of this furious historical re-pedestaling of heroes and its political consequences in my most recent book published last year called Incarnations, A History of India and Fifty Lives. The opening chapter of the idea of India is devoted to the Constitution's biggest act of faith, or, depending upon your point of view, its most reckless risk, the adoption of universal adult suffrage 
as the basis of political authority in India. Assessed purely by the fervor with which Indians have adopted the practice of voting, they have rewarded their founders' faith. Surveys reveal that today, more Indians than ever believe their votes actually count. And in elections in 2014, a record 66% of India's 814 million eligible voters turned out to cast their ballots. But what kind of democracy was this? To some left-wing critics, India's constitutional order, rooted as it was in a society where religion and caste retained their grip, would always necessarily favor the religious majority. Through this prism, Yogi Adityanath was a monk simply awaiting electoral coronation. Inevitably, the argument went, the strong suppressive powers inherited from the colonial past would be used whenever and wherever the majority felt numerically challenged or politically threatened. From this point of view, that regions like Kashmir and the Northeast have been kept essentially subject possessions is equally no cause for surprise. To critics of the right, on the other hand, India's constitutional democracy encouraged a bias towards India's minorities, Muslims and lower castes in particular, at the expense of Hindus. It was a constitution riddled with minority exceptionalism, imposed upon a disprivileged majority, and its provisions of secularism and toleration had become little more than opportunities for self-interested manipulation, or appeasement was the term, by a Congress-dominated political establishment. When I wrote my book, that establishment, that Congress-dominated establishment's failures were clear and the right-wing suspicions of the Constitution were threatening to prevail. Twenty years later, those advocates are now in power, their goals more closely in sight. In 1997, I wrote that the ambition of Hindu nationalism was to complete the project of achieving an Indian state by piloting towards what it saw as a logical terminus a culturally and ethnically cleaned up homogenous community with a singular Indian citizenship defended by a state that had God and nuclear weapons on its side. It was the BJP which kept alive most devotedly the ambition of modernization based on Western experiences of nationalism. And that's a quote from my book from 1997. All the BJP lacked when I was writing back then was a pilot for its modernizing, westernizing project. When that beacon emerged, it was in a form I had not thought likely, a dominating leader, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, as he is today. Since its, since its, its inception as a modern political movement in the 1920s, Hindu nationalism had worked, had avoided strong individual leaders in favor of tightly run organizations, disciplined cadres, and to an extent, collective leadership. In that respect, Modi's ascension through a display of political in that respect, Modi's ascension through a display of political entrepreneurship so far unmatched in India's democratic experience was as unnerving to some in his own movement and party as it has been for India's political system as a whole. Modi appealed to voters to trust his economic vision and developmental prowess a modernizer who got things done. But his political intentions were not so simple. He also envisioned the creation of a strong state commanded by Hindu interests, with economics as a means to that end. As the chief minister of his state, Gujarat, he had overseen an acceleration in its growth and development, as well as the most deadly violence directed against Muslims since the partition riots of 1947. That combination, growth, and the ever-present threat of lethal religious vengeance became a trademark as he went on to build a national image by propagating a new version of Hindutva. Originally, Hindutva had been an early 20th century mash of ingredients from Hindu scriptures, Matsinian nationalism, anti-individualist communitarianism, and 19th century European race theories an ideology designed to show that India rightfully belonged to Hindus. 
But Modi seasoned that religious ideology with one of economic efficacy. He claimed to have cracked the secret of economic development, centralized management, and tight, chable-like ties with the corporate world. And he served that up just as many predominantly Muslim countries were being torn apart, undermined first by Western military interventions and then consumed by internal violence. Violence that sometimes brought terror elsewhere, including to India. What better moment for political entrepreneurs in societies where Muslims form minorities to play on stereotype and fear? Now, as the BJP's hard ideology consolidates its hold over political power, as its religious affiliates expand their grip across civil society, and as India's opposition parties languish, it might seem that India is merely conforming to a global pattern. Across many parts of the world, entrenched elites have lost power to movements led by authoritarian figures, most of whom advocate more singular views of national community and are intolerant of dissent. In this harsher world, it seems inevitable to some that the idea of India will be permanently displaced by a narrower, more aggressive nationalism. It isn't inevitable, in my view, but the likelihood is, it's true, becoming more difficult to resist. In the country today, as Modi and his allies seek to eliminate all political opposition, and produce, as they put it, a Congress-free India, criticism and dissent are branded as anti-national, an excrescence on democratic politics rather than its natural enabling condition. Spaces of free thought, universities, the media, civil society organizations, are subject to pressure from state power, as well as from others in civil society, sometimes insidious and other times direct and brutal. Modi and the Hindu right are by no means unique or exceptional in the assault on these spaces. Across the states of the Union, regional leaders of all political hues have time and again cultivated authori authoritarian personality cults and tried to centralize power. Installed at the center, though, this will to power has effects more wide-ranging and damaging, conniving with, if not actually inciting, attacks on citizens who stray from ruling diktats and crippling intellectual independence. To conceive of the country in such ways is ultimately to weaken the very sinews that have given modern India its strength, the capacities of creative political argument, critical social imagination, and an independent mindedness that questioned and even redefined, as Gandhi did, the nature of power itself. If there's one theme that drives my book, indeed, that drives my entire understanding of modern India, it is the utter centrality of politics to modern India's experience. The fundamental fact that, as I put it, India does not merely have politics, India is constituted by politics. In the years since the book came out, that view, never particularly fashionable, has become less so. Economics, many have argued, will provide the solutions to India's dilemmas, stepping in where politics has so conspicuously failed. Certainly, India's economic surge over the past two decades has been spectacular, more rapid than anything I had expected. For 25 years now, beginning in the early 90s, GDP growth has, been around seven, has averaged around 7% a year, driving an eight-fold expansion of the Indian economy, and taking average incomes more than five times higher. With that growth came rising self-confidence amongst Indian elites that the country's moment had come. Simultaneously, the Indian state's tax revenues spurred an expansion of military expenditure, enough to move India into the top five military spenders in the world. And it's worth noting that the only other democracy apart from the US among those top five military spenders is India. India and the US are the only two democracies and the five top military spenders. Under Manmohan Singh's Congress-led coalition government, uh, formed in 2004, ambitious policy, policy initiatives began to direct some of the growth revenues into education and social provision. 
Poverty, as measured by official statistics, plummeted, and India experienced relative communal peace. Yet also during those years, corruption spread, political inertia and complacence set in, and that age-old affliction of India's Congress party, governmental droit de seigneur, took hold. Just as stubborn to change were many human development indicators, as India's re Indians' respective life chances, already in different universes, moved further apart. Mumbai now has twice as many billionaires as Los Angeles and San Francisco combined, while half of India's population has no more than a primary school education. I had expected, writing in 1997, that regional disparities, already deep-set, would persist for decades, testing in various ways the union and the idea of a shared national identity. As I wrote in my chapter on cities, the choices of global and of Indian capital, drawn to invest in already successful places, help compo compound that disparity, a pattern which is intensifying now. The result is deepening economic divergence both between states of the Union and, and this is important, within them as well. The latter, a hint that the problem lies not just with the varying qualities of governance across India's 29 states, but with India's pattern of economic development itself. The Indian economic, sorry, the Modi economic doctrine of competitive federalism, the optimistic belief that market discipline will push regional state governments to converge on investor-friendly policies, so reducing regional unevenness, evades the political strains that India's growth trajectory will place on the Union. Already, economic divergence at the regional level is stirring demands for new states and for India's more populous, poorer existing states to re receive greater national representation and uh, better uh, treatment in the Indian Finance, Finance Commission and so forth. The very fact that growth is being experienced so differently by citizens across the country makes it unlikely that pan-Indian social classes, whether poor or prosperous, might emerge and sustain themselves long enough to mitigate divisions or moderate conflicts. Faced with actual tensions, parties like the BJP assert that the solidarities of culture will best allow Indians to transcend divisions. But that too, I think, is an attempt to deny India's this inescapably political condition. As I wrote in 1997, there are no guarantees, economic, ideological, or cultural, that can hold a nation together. As I wrote then, it just depends on human skills. That is why politics, as an arena where different projects are proposed and decided for and against, has never been more important for Indians. What continues to keep India a functioning union and has made it one of the world's largest markets and a potential engine of the global economy is not some innate virtue or cultural uniqueness, an Indic tolerance, let us say. It's the fortunate result of keeping a political invention working, the imperfect, uh, the imperfect architecture of state, nation, and constitutional democracy set in place by India's founders. It was already clear to me in 1997 that rising prosperity would not necessarily produce a more open-minded middle class, potential stalwarts of liberal democratic politics. Surveying the expanding market and rising consumerism during those years of the late 90s, and of course it's much more today, I wrote then that that growth didn't, did not fuel an individualistic head, hedonism nor breed liberal individuals. Rather, it was experienced as an opportunity to sample the pleasures of modernity within collective units like the family, or I might have added, religious community. I wrote back then, for many in India, modernity has been adopted through the conservative filters of religious piety, moralism, and domestic virtue. What better example than Modi's home state, Gujarat? A textbook case of political stability in economic vigor and growth. With per capita income more than three times that of India's poorest state, 
and an aspirational, avidly consumerist middle class network to a global diaspora, it was also the epicenter of a novel, bloody religious of a novel, bloody religiosity. For days in the spring of 2002, Hindu gangs led by the rich and educated, among them doctors and lawyers, drove through the city using mobile phones and government-supplied computer printouts of electoral rolls to identify Muslim homes and direct attacks upon them. That murderous efficiency and technological targeting provided the basis for Modi's rise to national power. In that power's ability to keep India together as a territorial state, one should not underestimate the sometimes high-handed roles of India's bureaucracy and its military. These legacies of the Raj have periodically been deployed by Indian authorities uh, with a, a force at least equal to their colonial predecessors. Though tying young men to the front of army jeeps using citizens as human shields may be something of a new tactic, and the officer who commanded that action was suitably rewarded and honored uh, for his innovation, it comes from a deep bag of techniques gathered by the Indian state in its efforts to maintain territorial unity. Yet military and bureaucracy alone have never been enough to hold India together, and nor will they be. Equally important has been, and must continue to be, India's constitutional democracy. At its inception, the founding architects of the Indian state wagered on a design that might resist